Let's go to God in prayer again. Father, we thank you for your word. Teach us your word, O oh Lord. We need your word. In this time in which we face this election time, Lord, as we look to our we look to you, Lord, for the strength that we need. And and although we have human leaders, we pray, Lord, we would look to you for strength, for our help. And Lord, I pray that you would remind us that we are aliens and strangers in this world, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you would help us in this time, in this season, as we need you at all times. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Nancy Abel tried to get a lady named Katharina Groney to turn back, but with 150 miles to go on her solo hike along the Pacific Crest Trail, Groney wanted to see her adventure through. And Abel met Groney last month in Washington after Groney had walked 2,500 miles northward from the Mexican border, just walking along the Pacific coast. And it was late in the season, Abel was concerned because this lady Groney did not have snowshoes and it was getting colder and colder and colder. Well, she couldn't stop thinking about this German hiker all alone in the mountains. And a few days later, when forecasters said they were expecting snow in the mountains, Abel called the Sonomish County Sheriff's Office, explaining that Groney might be in trouble. And sure enough, Groney was dehydrated, disoriented, and thought she might have frostbite. She kept falling down, and she kept willing herself to get back up, a sign of hypothermia, surrounded by evergreens that were sinking under the weight of the snow. And she she screamed for help. No one heard her. And she got out her phone, began to record messages for her friends and family, saying goodbye to them and saying she was sorry for dying on the trail. Well, fortunately, officers launched a search and soon found her, and rescuers said it was likely she would have died within a day. You know, we're all lost and dying. We're all lost in our sin. We're lost in our arrogance. We're lost in our pride. We're lost in the woods of our own making. And God has made a way out. We have, made a, we have been lost in the, in the woods of our own making, and we want to find a path out that we create. But God has created the path to get out. He has provided a way out. God has made a path and a direction, but we reject it. We look for another way, but there is no other way. Jesus said in, uh, about himself in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The Apostle Peter declared to the Sanhedrin Council, the same body that condemned our Lord to death said, And there is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Only in Christ. Are we saved? Only in Christ can we find the way out. What other name would you use? What other name would you trust? What other name is able to do what Christ has done, is doing, and continues to do? You know, a popular catchphrase in our pandemic-riddled 2020 year, only two months to go, <laughs> popular catchphrase is, Follow the science. What does that mean other than politicians' expectation that, well, I'm right and he's wrong or whatever? If I were to say, I don't follow the science, I've committed a heresy. I have crossed the line. I've rejected dogma and I need to be burned at the stake. I mean, we've taken it to that level. Follow the science means what? I don't know what it means. But I can tell you that science is not infallible. It's not the gospel message. It's not absolute. It certainly is not the path to the salvation we need. In this pandemic-riddled year with all our knowledge of medicine, medical technology, and the understanding of bacteria and viruses, we are stumped over this virus. It has stumped us, and because of that, it should have humbled us as a people. But instead, what do we do? Follow the science. This pandemic should have brought us to our knees and caused us to cry out to God and say, God, help us. We need you. With all of our brilliance, we don't know what to do, but instead, repentance is not even mentioned. It's not discussed. It's not even brought up. Why not follow the one who created science? Follow the one who created the heavens and the earth, who created you and me. Follow him. 
Follow the one who created the science. Seek him, know him, humbly bow before him. In Revelation, John sees and hears the seven trumpets. And each trumpet's not a good sound and not a good outcome. <laughs> the world is falling apart. Animals, the environment, and man are dying. Demons are unleashed. Then there's the sixth trumpet where there's three plagues that are unleashed, or uh, plague, three plagues are unleashed and a third of mankind is killed. And in, Ma- in Revelation 9, it says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as, to not, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and the works of their hands so as not to worship excuse me, uh, brass, stone, wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. This is arrogance and pride at the highest level to, and hate toward God. Those who survived the plagues mentioned in Revelation 9 followed the science, followed their own great Im- ignorant hearts, and they followed their sin-filled hearts and their minds, and they followed idols and their immoral desires. They let pride lead them. And in this plague, it was a call to repentance, and they did not repent. You know, when we go through the evil of this evil age, it's every opportunity. Everything we go through is an opportunity to repent and fall before God and say, God, I need you. We need you. You know, the three plagues mentioned in Revelation, I'm not saying they're necessarily COVID, the COVID virus. But still, every opportunity that we face is an opportunity for repentance and a call out to God that we need him. We're called in this situation, this time right now, to look to God and say, we need you. We need you, God. Follow the one who created science. Follow God. Receive Christ. Accept Christ. Call on him. Call him Lord. Bow before the Almighty and rely on his voice and his word and his truth. He is the foundation of truth. All that we go through, good or bad, difficult or easy, tragic or joyful, is an opportunity to worship God, is an opportunity to give Him praise, acknowledge His sovereign reign, and remember His promises of faithfulness and hope and joy. What this means is that no situation we ever face, we should ever take our eyes off of God, off of what Scripture says, but we should always seek His desires and His will, regardless of what we face and endure. Every situation and circumstance is an opportunity to look to God. So I challenge you today. Look to God. Look to God for all your needs. Look to God in every situation. Look to God in His Word, in His church, in His Son, in His Spirit, and all that He is accomplishing. Peter, in his letter to the churches, wants the churches to look to God in every situation and certainly to stay attentive to every situation to God, to stay attentive to God. He wants the church to live in such a way that will exalt God, worship God, follow God, look to God. And by doing that, it will seem that how you live and how you act, people will see the, our God in you. All that we do will be a direct statement of who God is, that He is Lord and He is worthy. And Peter is calling the church to live a life where people see God in you and in me. That is the Christ life. So look to God. Number one, take inventory of your heart. Let's look at chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. To sum up, All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or your insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil." You know, when Pilate took Christ aside during his trial, he questioned him, and Jesus eventually said, everyone who is of the truth uh, hears my voice. And then Pilate looked at him, and he says, what is truth? And without waiting for an answer, he turns and he walks away, he reali- not realizing he was speaking to Christ, who is truth. Earlier in John, Jesus said, and you will know the truth, and the truth will ma- set you free, will make you free. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, John 14. 
It is said of God that he's the light and there is no darkness, meaning he is the truth. Light and truth are the same in the New Testament. Christ is the light of the world. He is the truth. In John 1, it says there was the true light which, co- which coming into the world enlightens every man. Christ is the truth. When we endeavor to find truth, as this world seeks truth, in our age of enlightenment, we are in reality seeking to find what is good. The hope is to find what is good is the search for truth. And that is why you'll hear people say, well, that truth is okay for you, but not okay for me because they're talking about good. There is no absolute truth, just relative truth. We hear a lot of that. This is the mantra repeated. It's really saying there's no absolute good, just relative good. Good is what you make of it, how you experience it, or how you derive good in the world around you. This is not what good is, and it's not what truth is. Truth is good, God is good, and God never allowed us to define what good is. And we do it all the time. When the serpent spoke to Eve, he asked, Did God say? Genesis chapter 1. Uh, two, three, excuse me. Meaning, is God good? The reality is that when we understand what good is, we know truth because God is truth. God is good and He is truth. Truth is bathed in love, the love of God. Truth without love is not good. Rather, it's it's self-righteous and judgmental. And love without truth has no boundary, no morals. It's not good. Truth can only be known in the character of God, and truth can only be understood in the context of love. Truth is good, and Christ is truth, and God is love. I say this because when you examine your heart, you have to realize that your heart has taken in the lies of this evil age. Your heart has darkness and hardness. There's unbelief in your heart. There are idols in your heart. You have to take inventory of your heart daily, and you have to repent of those things that are there. They don't belong there. You have to repent of them. The truth of God will expose your heart. And when he exposes your heart, he reaches out to heal you, to save you, redeem you, bless you. To take inventory of your heart, you have to let God examine your heart with his holy gaze. And it'll hurt. It's okay. Let him examine your heart with his holy gaze. You have to come clean. Every lie, every thought, every idol has to be taken captive and and given to the lordship of Christ. Then you'll know what is good, and you'll know the truth. Because God, as he looks into you, is not trying to destroy you, to hate you, but to love you. So look to God. Number, Number one, unite your heart to God. You know, Peter in his letter sums up what he's been saying throughout. Be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. Peter tells the church in regard to the relationships that the church has to let the truth of God's word produce the good char- good the goods of God's character, if you will. <laughs> the good Peter is calling the church to live out comes from a heart that has been exposed to God's word and his holy gaze. And God's truth. What is the outcome? You are harmonious. That word is used only here in 1 Peter, and and it means to be like-minded. It's similar to what you read in Philippians 2, where it says to have the same mind of Christ, same mind of thinking about Christ. Think similar thoughts about who Christ. Christ is what unites us. We think of Christ the same way. We act in the same way that Christ acts. We are like-minded. We're united together. We see Christ in the same way. You're not, and then as a result, you're to be sympathetic, meaning you are to understand each other. It is said of Christ in Hebrews 4, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things yet without sin, who has sympathy, can sympathize. I must have actually had a word there. there. Uh, sympathize is the same word you use. Christ is, has sympathized with us. He knows us. He knows the difficulties we we go through. He has walked in our shoes. We carry that attitude that Christ has. We are brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. These are the characteristics of Christ. And you exhibit them. And you live these out. As the Word of God feeds your heart. As the Holy Gaze exposes exposes the things in your heart and you get rid of them. 
you begin to exhibit these things, these characteristics. So let God have His way in your life. When you, dis- when you let the holy gaze of God examine your heart, He's making you a new heart that will demonstrate these characteristics. The whole, God's holy gaze will root out the evil, but then you confess it and repent of it. A heart transformed by God will develop new reactions. Typically, in a sinful nature, we react that is not loving. That's why Peter said, we do not return evil for evil and insult for insult. Instead, we seek to bless. The person who's insulted you, if someone insults you, it usually elicits a response of equal Anger, (laughs) well, you insult me, I'll insult you ten times worse. And it just keeps going higher and higher. I'm going to pound you into the dirt. (laughs) And then we, it just, it, it just escalates. Just listen to the political leaders as the insults just keep increasing. That's human nature, that's what we see. We see that every day in our human interactions and the power of God's heart placed inside of you will seek to bless and not hurt, love instead of hate, and build up others instead of tear down. Imagine if we reacted in love in every situation, how we would change consistently our culture. What happened is your reaction is changed by God. Number two, let worship be your first reaction. When you act in a manner we read about in these verses, you're letting worship be your first reaction. You're looking first to God, then you look to the people around you. Looking to God first will always give you the right way to react. Peter used many scripture quotations here. It says, for the one who desires life, to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. As we barrel down the road of deceit and sin, we bring the effects and outcomes of sin upon us more and more. We contribute death to our culture with the deceit in our mouth and the immoralities in our mind. And we don't want to do that. We want to contribute the life of Christ to those around us, for that is good. And he says, he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. But the problem is, we want to define evil, and we want to define what peace is. No, this is your definition. God's nature is your definition. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of talk about evil and bad things happening today. No mention of God's Word. And as a church, as the voice, the moral, godly, gospel voice of God in this world, we are to set the record straight and say, this is what is good. Christ is good. The cross exposes you who are not good, but you are good in Christ because He puts His righteousness in you if you will repent of your sins and come to Him. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, verse 12, and His ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So let's be a people who seek all that God wants in our heart, for we want our prayers answered. And I'm not talking about like, Lord, give me a million dollars. Lord, our community is dying and they need you. Those are the prayers we want answered. Lord, open the hearts and minds of those who cannot see you. Lord, help this person. They're struggling. They need your healing touch. Lord, there's fear in this person's heart. Lord, give them peace. Those are the prayers we want answered. It comes from the heart of God. God's heart put in you. The only way to overcome evil is to fall before God and look to God. What temptations are you facing now? What lies have you believed? What sins have you not repented? Look to God. Find truth. No good. Live right. Look to God. Number two, take action making Christ known. Let's look at 13, verse 13. 
Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, and always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, with gentleness and reverence. And keeps a good conscience, so that in the things in which you have slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God, if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right, rather for doing what is wrong. Well, there's a lady named Nene Hammond, and she was an executive editor for the Southeast Outlook in Louisville, Kentucky. And in 1988, she was working as a reporter for a small newspaper in uh, Lebanon, Kentucky, before she took this other job. Well, May 14th of that year, newspapers throughout the sto- uh, country carried a story about a bus, cra- a bus crash where 24 children and three adults died in what was called the worst drunken driving accident in Kentucky history. And uh, the bus carried the youth group of the First Assembly of God Church in Radcliffe, Kentucky, and, and Nene did not cover the story. Many of her friends were reporters in the country where the children were from, and And witnesses who survived the crash told of one particular passenger named Chuck Kaita, the youth minister of the church. And Chuck was seen in the front of the bus behind the driver when the gas tank exploded a heartbeat after the collision, and he was instantly encircled in flames. And when Chuck saw the flames around him, witnesses said he looked up, lifted up his hands, and he says, Jesus, I'm coming home with a smile on his face. Uh, Nini wrote, I was not a Christian in 1988, so I couldn't ma- make any sense of what Chuck did. Here's this cool guy with a bunch of kids that call him Banana, standing in flames, moments from a horrible death, and he's smiling? No matter how hard she tried, Nini could not erase from her mind this image of this man crying out, Lord Jesus, I'm coming home. And she says, the only way to explain how a man could calmly accept, almost welcome a painful death was to acknowledge that he understood some great truth I didn't that he had something, faith, hope, God, maybe, something. I didn't have it. And as try as I might, I couldn't help yearning for whatever he had that made death a thing to embrace rather than fear. Two years later, she came to Christ. And then she says, Chuck Kaita planted a seed in me that took a root in my heart. One day I will see Chuck in heaven, and I'll tell him how the manner of his death pointed me toward eternal life. You know, as you live looking to God and people will see God in you, they will see the Christ life. As God's holy gaze shines his heart, his light into your heart, people will see the God we love and who loves them. Peter asks an interesting question there in verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it can happen. Those who seek to harm you for zealously seeking what is good are those who have defined good differently than what you think it is or what God's Word says it is. I'm reminded of Isaiah 5.20 that says this, What are those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? That's what we do all the time. We don't even realize it because this is what sets us straight. Those who call evil good are those who will persecute you, zealously living out the good of God's character and God's goodness. If you do suffer for doing good, then understand it's a blessing. I'm blessed for suffering for what is good. (laughs) Do not fear intimidation. Do not be troubled, it says there in verse 14. Do you realize that every day that that you are in some way facing intimidation by culture demanding you accept certain ideas? and bow certain ways of thinking. We're constantly intimidated by what we are confronted in the culture. We face intimidation by our culture, our political intrigues, pundits, and commentators. We face intimidation by our culture inculcating us to unbelief in God. We face intimidation in our education, our jobs, our local communities. You will think this way. You will accept this way of thinking. You will act a certain way. You will say the right things. I'm here to tell you, look to God in all things. Never waver in your belief in Him. Never worry about what it may cost you for following Him because He is faithful. Peter tells the church the way you stand against intimidation is by sanctifying Christ in your heart, there in verse 15. Sanctify Christ in your heart, number one. And what does that mean? You're to put Christ at the top of the list, the main focus. Always be prepared. He has to have a complete attention. 
Sanctified Christ means I listen to his voice and only his voice. Among all the shouting that's going on in this evil age, I listen to the voice of Christ. As the voices of this world rage on, we hear Christ's voice. We pay attention to what he is saying. Sanctified Christ means to walk as he walked, to do what he did, to live as he lived, to forgive as he forgave, to restore, to heal, to lift, to die to self, to love, to overcome, to walk in the manner that is good, good based on the word of God, not in the manner the world defines good. Sanctify Christ in your heart means you're ready for the questions that will come, and they will come. Peter said that you're ready to make a defense in regard to the hope that you have. You're ready to speak the gospel. The word for make a defense is that Greek word apologia, which we get the word apologetics. You may have heard apologetics, you know, and there's uh, many books that have been written to defend the faith. There are, there are lots of, of YouTube videos with Christian scholars debating atheists, or uh, maybe you've seen that on YouTube. You've, I've watched a few where they're debating atheists, and you have these uh, guys, and it's good, good context to watch, good way to learn things. There uh, there's, has been incredible research done in the science of what's called textual criticism. You say, well, what is textual criticism? Well, it, it, I'm glad you asked. Textual criticism is that science where they examine all the manuscripts that have that the New Testament and Old Testament have, and they look at them, and, they, and it, it has shown that what we are reading is what it was written. It was not added to. There are no mistakes. It's true. What we are reading is what was written down, and science and textual criticism has demonstrated. In fact, the New Testament has so many ma- ancient manuscripts that they can test if what we are reading is what we was written originally. And the Bible is so well preserved that it's more accurate than Shakespeare. There are many importantly scholarly works out there to help you give answer to skeptics and atheists and secular humanists, but I would encourage you to do that, to watch these videos, read these books on, uh, on the Bible and on how to answer the the you know, questions that are around us. And you can even come talk to me or even Emmett. You know, he's an a, a apologetics expert, I would say. But I will say that our greatest apologetic, our greatest answer to any skeptic is the love of God and the love that we have for each other. It is, our love, it is the love of God that will bring the sinner to the cross, the hard-hearted to repentance and arrogance to the humili- and from arrogance to humility. It's the love of God that will be the greatest answer. His love does not fail. If we neglect our love for one another, we will struggle to give an adequate answer. If we neglect the love of God, we will not give a convincing answer. Remember, the, enemies has, has, the enemy has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. The human mind and spirit, according to Roman 1, suppresses the truth of God. There is an activity of downright disregard for who God is and what he has done. This is not a rational problem. There's a deliberate act of ignorance on the part of God. When you speak the gospel and give an answer of your faith, it is not a rational, logical problem you're dealing with. It's a sin-filled, suppressing heart you're dealing with. Have you ever read The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> you know, in the second adventure called The Red-Headed League, Dr. Watson comes to the house of Sherlock Holmes and where an elderly gentleman is visiting the great detective. Now, in the midst of the dialogue, uh, Watson admits of a problem of not believing Sh- uh, Sherlock Holmes. And he says, a proposition is what I took the liberty of doubting, said Watson. And then the great detective said, you did, doctor, but nonetheless, you must come around to my view, for otherwise else you'll keep piling fact upon fact until your reason breaks down under them and acknowledges me to be right. I shall pile fact upon fact. The attempt to declare the message of Christ with fact upon fact will not always work because you're not dealing with a logical issue. You're dealing with a sin-filled, suppressing heart that has, no, has a disregard for God. You're asking a person to humble themselves, to repent and be broken because of the sin in their heart. And that takes the Holy Spirit. Yes, give them the answers they're seeking. 
but then say, God, you got to go, you got to break through. Because that's something I can't do. You got to break through. Because <laughs> their sin filled heart is not going to let them see. As you look to God and as the intimidation increases, you do not give in, but you stand firm. Stand solid, and the people, the world around you, the community will see the God who loves them. So look to God. Number three, take the initiative of healing the hurting. Verse 18 says, For Christ also died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, having after angels and authorities and powers have been subject to him. You know, in 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm and movable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. By staying immovable and steadfast, the culture will attack you. The idea that we are called to suffer is rooted in the cross. Christ died for you. Christ suffered for you. We're called to suffer. Christ suffered, and we're suffer. We suffer when we stand steadfast in the gospel and in Christ. We suffer for the world is suppressing the truth of God and his goodness. Jesus suffered for you by dying on the cross. Christ died on the cross for you, took away your sins. He paid the price of your sins. He did this to restore your relationship with God so you can have a relationship with God and a future home in heaven. What Peter's doing here in 3.18 is repeating a confession, a statement the church would often repeat because they didn't have the New Testament, so they would repeat a confession. So let's give it a try. I have on the screen here. Here, let's say these words together. Christ died for your sins on the cross. He rose again on the third day. He defeated death. He forgives you of your sins. He reconciled you to God. It, you see, this is a way to keep in mind of who God is and what he's done. And we should do this daily. You should out loud say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life, and you saved me from my sins. You ought to just shout it out. Be in the grocery store and just shout it out. See what happens. <laughs> Number one, the cross defeated evil. You know, when he says in which he made a proclamation to the spirits now in prison, it's like he's shouting out, the evil is defeated. And Christ did it. You know, it's similar to what Paul wrote in Colossians when he said, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. That's a similar way of what he's saying here. He went to hell itself and says, you're defeated. You have no authority anymore. I have overcome you. And we walk in the, today, right now, hell is defeated because of Christ. The kingdom of hell is defeated. The demonic world stands condemned. The host of evil are doomed. Christ's death and resurrection has secured that defeat. Peter reminds the church that like Noah is a minority in the midst of a majority who are in unbelief and disobedient. We too are in the midst of unbelief, disobedience, and suppression of truth. But just like Noah, we too are in Christ and our faith in Christ, our love for Christ, and his love for us will be delivered because the cross defeated evil. Number two, Christ saves you. Peter saw the church as a minority in the midst of, un- of a majority of unbelief. And as we travel looking to God, we are delivered. But then he says, now baptism saves you. And what he's talking about here is this baptism of faith. We have to have faith in the gospel. Because he says, you know, it's not like the waters are some sort of magical thing that the minute I touch it, ooh, you know. It's, it's, it's our faith in him. And the reality that Christ, having resurrected from the dead, the salvation is in Christ. Where is Christ? He's at the right hand of God. He has has victory. He has has given salvation to us. He has defeated evil. He's overcome the kingdom of hell. He has saved you from your sins. And so he says, come to him. Don't follow anyone, but follow the one who created us. Will you surrender your life and heart today to him? Will you repent of your sins? Will you accept the love God has for you and embrace his mercy? Will you let God's holy gaze examine 
your heart. Look to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the cross, the salvation we have, the hope we have, the joy we have. Lord, let your holy gaze examine our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.